contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. adventures start in Queensland and we'll work our way south to the Gold Coast. Then it's over the border into New South Wales, taking an inland route before leaving Sydney westwards on the famous Indian Pacific train into South Australia, where we explore the historic Gann Line through to the Red Centre. Then back onto the Indian Pacific to take me into Western Australia and right across to the West Coast and some terrific railway adventures. Then we'll take the fast route right across to the state of Victoria where the railway lines are like following an old treasure map. A place full of riches and well worth exploring. Finally, over the ocean to Australia's only island state, Tasmania, to visit its remote wilderness and rediscover its historic railways. The Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest marine park. This place is so big that when the explorer Captain Cook came here in 1770, he sailed inside the reef for days before he even suspected it was there. And he was no slouch as a navigator either. Hi, I'm Scott McGregor and... We're here in Queensland for railway adventures, not coral adventures. But you can't come to Queensland without visiting the reef. So I thought I'd get this onerous task out of the way first. Besides, there's no reason I can't talk about trains in a beautiful place like this. Queensland's rail history is a rich and colourful one. With more than 6,000 miles of track, it's certainly the largest rail network in Australia. In the early days, there was a big demand for rail here. But because of the vast distances involved and the isolated population, it also had to be a cheap railway to build. For this reason, Queensland adopted narrow gauge, or three foot six in the old language, and in so doing, became the first place in the world to use narrow gauge as its main operating railway. This has given trains in Queensland a special character all of their own. Like those we're going to meet on our first adventure in the far northeast of the state. Mossman is a major centre for the sugar industry. It's also the home of some of the hardest working little trains in the country. The mill has agreed to let me ride on their trains for the day, but the privilege has come at a price. I've actually got to earn my keep and put in a day's work. They drive a hard bargain up here, these northerners. G'day, you George? That's right. Oh, I'm Scott. Apparently I'm assigned to you today, is that right? That's correct. <laughs> right, come along. George is a local with an interesting pedigree. His grandfather came from the West Indies, and his mum's a Thursday Islander, with a little bit of German blood mixed in for good measure. He reckons Mossman is the best place in the world to live. Undoubtedly, the prettiest part of the world that I've seen. And here you are amongst it every day, driving out into the hills like this. Very, very lucky. There's a set of points here, so pull up. I'll get you to change those points. All right. Just check the blades to make sure that when you do change it, there's no rocks between the blades. He's got a good reason for saying that. If a rock jams between these rails, it could derail the train. And that would be the end of my career as a fireman, I suspect. This reminds me of my days with the scout troop when I was a kid. Take it easy, Darcy. Don't worry about a thing now, mate. He might as well make the mess of it. Rest his legs while he can. <laughs> 
sugarcane is really just an oversized member of the grass family. Once upon a time, they used to burn the crop before harvesting, but now they let the leaves stay on the ground because it's better for the soil. Our job is to make sure the mill is constantly supplied with cane. During the harvesting season, which is from mid-June to September, the mill and these little trains go for 24 hours a day until the entire crop is in. Is that it, George? Bloody, one last favour before you finish, mate. Oh, he's a slave driver, this bloke. Yeah. Could you take us up the waivers and give us a traffic controller, please? My pleasure, mate. I've had a top day. Good on you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank All right. See ya. Only a short distance south is Cairns and the Coranda Scenic Railway. Once a busy goods line connecting the inland agricultural and mining centres with the coast. Now, it operates as one of the most beautiful tourist rail journeys in the world. Built between 1886 and 1891, it travels from Cairns on the coast up to Coranda on the edge of the Atherton Tableland. The first stop on the line after Cairns is Freshwater Station. We'll get on board here. Over half a million people travel on this railway every year. It's the most popular one in the country and you'll soon see why. From zero to a thousand feet above sea level, the train takes 90 minutes to journey through 15 hand-carved tunnels, dozens of bridges and some spectacular scenery. At one point, we travel within feet of the Stony Creek Falls, our carriage suspended in the air on this fantastic trestle bridge. What an ideal tourist railway and an engineering marvel. To find out why this line was built here, you've got to go right back to the big wet of 1882. Inland, up on the Atherton Tableland, the tin miners were starving to death because supplies couldn't get through to them along the treacherous boggy track from the coast. They began to agitate for a railway. This big figure of rock here was left by the blokes who constructed the line as a memorial to all those who lost their lives in its building. It's called Rob's Monument. Construction was, and still is, considered a tremendous engineering feat. Built in three stages, hundreds of men worked on it, and many lost their lives, especially on the perilous second stage up the mountain range. Official records show that there were 23 deaths in all, but it's thought that many others went unrecorded. Landslides wrought havoc during construction and the steep slopes, fever and accidents with dynamite also took their toll. Forging of the tunnels was a complex job in itself. And they did all this with buckets, dynamite and their bare hands. There were no jackhammers and bulldozers in those days, of course. In June 1891, after five years of construction, the 21 and a quarter miles of the Cairns to Coranda line was opened. Coranda must be one of the most beautiful railway stations in the world. The tropical climate ensures a lush green atmosphere pervades the air. It's a pleasure simply to sit here for a while and take in the peaceful old world charm of the place. Time to be moving on. I'm booked on the Sunlander, heading south. The Sunlander is just one of a series of trains that run up and down Queensland's 6,000 miles of track. In fact, Queensland is well served by its rail network. However, not long ago, the network was even more expansive than it is now. Lines went everywhere, to mining towns, agricultural centres, and through to remote regions in the outback. I'm on my way to visit the home of a classic steam train in one of Queensland's most idyllic valleys. Some of the old branch lines survive through institutions like this one, commonly known as rail or steam heritage societies. This is the Mary Valley Rattler, and she runs every Sunday down the old Mary Valley branch line, from Gympie to Imble and back. 
the people who keep these trains running are usually all dedicated volunteers. They invest a lot of their own time and labour into it and take the job very seriously, even down to wearing the correct railway uniforms, direct from the golden age of steam. Okay. These blokes, and women too, I think some of them have more fun than they dare to admit. Oh, okay. Ken. Scott. You like playing trains? I've got a big train set, mate. <laughs> no one can argue with that. <laughs> no. But look, you're all in the garb. I love the pit helmet. That's so people can take the pit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now we're talking about it, what carriage have you got me in? Sorry, Scott, you haven't booked. We're full. You're kidding, you've got five carriages in. I know, but you should have booked earlier. You that popular? That popular. The only way you can see the train today is to go by car. No doubt about it, they take it seriously with all these crossing guards with their red flags, green flags and bells. A quick history lesson here. The Mary Valley Line came into being in 1914 in order to supply the gold mining town of Gympie with timber and farm produce from the fertile Mary Valley. Here endeth the lesson. On its 30 mile return trip, the train passes through some spectacular countryside. Natural scrub, pasture land and pineapple plantations. Excellent photo opportunity. Oh. It's an occupational hazard talking to yourself. Train buffs are renowned for it. Heritage Society has something different to offer. I think the charm of the Mary Valley Rattler is the sheer enthusiasm of the people who run it. So, even though I didn't get to ride on the train, I still had a great day. Let's lift the tempo a little now and head towards one of Australia's best known stretches of beach. Nothing else, Queensland's a land of contrasts, from the Barrier Reef to the vast inland. And now this, the Miami-like skyline of the Gold Coast. You don't need to guess where I feel most at home. And you know, just down the end of the beach there, New South Wales. We're heading into the second of the six Australian states on our journey. Byron Bay is the most easterly point on the Australian mainland and this is where we begin our New South Wales leg of the adventure. 
110 miles from Brisbane and 500 miles to the north of the state's capital, Sydney, Byron Bay is a great holiday destination. It's the subtropical climate and the magic qualities of this place that attracts them. Beautiful long beaches set against a magnificent backdrop of mountains. The village of Byron Bay itself is a lively place which combines the atmosphere of a country town and a beachside resort. I'm told the tourist overload during the holiday season puts a real strain on the environment and the locals have been battling the big developers for years in an effort to avoid the high-rise fate of the Gold Coast. Byron Bay wasn't always a tourist resort. For years, it was simply a timber and beef town on the north coast. Then, in 1954, it became a busy whaling station. By the time the industry collapsed in 1962, 1,146 humpback whales had been processed at this local meatworks. That's an interesting little loco. I wonder what happened to it. I'm told it's still around. So, while we're here, we may as well have a look for it. Follow the track out of town and look for a new tin shed, one of the locals said. This looks likely. I think I've found it. What a little beauty. Meet the green frog, as this little loco is affectionately known. She was a much-loved sight in Byron Bay in the old days, giving faithful service to the community for over 60 years. This little 1923 simplex petrol locomotive was the backbone of industry here in Byron Bay. It hauled the dairy, the beef, the timber, the whales. It even hauled passengers occasionally. Solid as a rock, all cast iron, weighs eight tonnes. What a little ripper. It's good to see she's been treated with a bit of respect in her old age. Byron Bay Railway Station is right in the middle of town, which is very convenient. I'm a little early for the next train. I can't believe this. A pub at a railway station. Don't see that every day. Excellent. The Railway Friendly Bar has been a licensed railway refreshment room right from the turn of the century. In 1952, it became a private lease and the bar has been part of Byron Bay's landscape ever since. In fact, today, the pub is known the world over as a must-visit destination. Right, on to Newcastle. Train journey south takes us through banana plantations, along the scenic coast and onwards to one of the oldest industrial centres in Australia. This is Newcastle. I'm on the local rail motor service into town. This old thing goes pretty well for something that was built in 1948. Newcastle is rightly called the hub of the Hunter Valley. It's a maritime city, highly industrialised. Originally founded in 1797 as a penal colony for exporting coal and salt. The coal exporting side of the business is still going strong in the 1990s. Much of the industry in Newcastle is winding down now, leading the locals to turn their minds to other things to keep their city vibrant. Tourism is now high on the agenda, and with very good reason too. How many industrialised cities in the world do you know that have fantastic surf beaches like these, right in the inner city suburbs? There's plenty of history too. This is Fort Scratchley, built in 1881 to defend the young colony against the Russians. They seem to get the blame for everything. It last defended the city during World War II, when it fired on some Japanese submarines. It was the last time these guns were fired in anger. 
The submarines that attacked Newcastle on the night of the 8th of June 1942 later moved further down the coast and opened fire on Sydney. For the next part of our journey, I'm jumping an empty coal train. G'day, I'm Scott. Uh, Scott, Keith Gilbert. Good on you, Keith. Scott. Cheers. How are you? Uh, Gary, hold you. Good on Gary. All right. This will be a little different. Now, for some real power. Which is our train? That's, that's, the, that's the number of all the trucks. Right. And there's 84 trucks. There's 1,420 metres long. <laughs> About 75 million tonnes of coal is dug out of the Hunter each year. That's a heck of a lot of coal. No wonder these trains are so long. The coal train takes us close to Mudgee in central New South Wales where I keep my own personal train collection. I've come back here for a while to pick something up. Now, you may be wondering why I'm so keen on old railway memorabilia. Well, it all started when I was a boy. I was raising money one day from a scout troop. I was working at Orange Railway Station when a little steam locomotive rolled in. The driver leaned out of the window and said to me, hey mate, you wanna come up here and earn your money? <laughs> so, of course, I joined him for the day. Got myself black all over from shoveling coal. When I went back to the scoutmaster that night and showed him my card, he read it out to all the other boys. Driving a steam locomotive, one dollar. Well, from that moment on, I was hooked. Years later, when it came time to put a house on this place, I thought, what about old railway carriages? And why not? They're big and roomy, and full of character. Anyway, you're probably wondering why I've come home. Well, I want to show you my favourite railway line in New South Wales. It's the little branch line to Cowra. Unfortunately, like so many other little lines around the country, no trains run on this one anymore. So I'm going to have to use my own steam. This line was put through to Cowra in 1888 and it runs through some very historic New South Wales countryside. Never forget the rules and regulations about heading into a tunnel. Whistle! Once upon a time, these parts were alive with bush rangers. Most notably, Ben Hall and the John Gilbert gang. They terrorised the poor folk around here right through the 1860s until the law caught up with them and hung them. They were after the gold, of course. There used to be a lot of it discovered around here. You're probably wondering what I'm riding on here today. It's officially known as a Trafalgar Velocipede, more commonly known as a hand trike. 70 kilometres an hour, they must be kidding! These little things were used in and around station yards to fix signals and do odd jobs like that. This is a rare two-man version, dates from about 1900. It must have been hard work working one of these across the countryside day in, day out. I feel like I'm making a railway exercise video. On the surface, Cowra is a typical New South Wales country town, but there are special international links that make this place unique. For example, the people of Cowra go to great lengths to nurture the ideals of peace and international friendship. 
This is exemplified through Australia's World Peace Bell in Civic Square. The bell is a replica of the original, hanging at the United Nations building in New York. The community's efforts to foster these ideals go back to World War II, when a prisoner of war camp was built here. Constructed in 1941, the camp initially held Italian and German prisoners of war, but in 1944, it was expanded to hold Korean, Formosan and Japanese prisoners. Disgraced in their own minds by their capture, the Japanese sought to overcome their shame in the most dramatic way possible. At 1.50 a.m. on the 5th of August 1944, the largest prisoner of war breakout in modern military history took place at Kaura. Over a thousand Japanese prisoners launched a suicidal attack on their guards, the Australian soldiers of the 22nd Garrison. By the time the breakout was over, 231 Japanese and four Australians lay dead. The Japanese who died in the breakout were buried here in Kaura. And the local ex-servicemen have taken it upon themselves to look after their graves. Now it's time I made a serious run for Sydney and my date with the Indian Pacific. I've got to get up and over the Blue Mountains first. Normally that's a fairly straightforward exercise. I jump on a train here at Lithgow and along this line here, ten tunnels later and two hours later, I'm in Sydney. But I'd like to do something much more interesting. I'm going to go on the old route. In this 1960s retro rail motor. But first, I've got to find my driver. At just five miles in length, the zigzag railway was once acclaimed as one of the great engineering wonders of the 19th century. It was built between 1866 and 1869 to enable trains to negotiate the steep western face of the mountains. After much deliberation, it was decided that a series of lengthy tunnels through the mountains was far too expensive. A giant zigzag was the cheapest option. The railway is still in operation today as a tourist line. Well, we'll just get the air on and we'll go. Meet driver Michael Forbes. He's been with the railway for over 25 years. The bottom road of the Great Zigzag is still used by the State Rail Authority. Oh, so it's still part of the lines of the West. Okay. We actually have our depot on the site of the original bottom road. They just carved a giant Z in the side of the hill. So if you imagine the three bars of the Z are your tracks. They all slope gently down into the valley at a grade of 1 in 42. That's one foot down for every 42 feet you travel. And that sort of grade can be handled safely by a train. We're on the middle road. We are now on the middle road of the Great Zigzag. Yeah, see, I know the route. <laughs> Now what we've got to do is swap ends. Got to drive from the other end. So we go up the other end? Yep. Cut. We've come up as far as top points. It's here that the train reverses direction to go along the top bar of the Z. Excellent. Two bells from the guard means everybody's locked in and we can leave. We're now travelling along the top road of the Z towards the station at Clarence, the top of the line. Hit the big smoke. If someone asked me what Sydney was all about, I would say to them, Sydney is flashy, fast and vibrant. Founded in 1788, it's the oldest city in Australia 
and its beautiful deep water harbour makes it one of the most famous and attractive cities in the world. Sydney siders are in love with the water and with good reason. Not only do they have the harbour, but they're also blessed with some of the most beautiful beaches on the eastern seaboard. The harbour has always been Sydney's focal point. Locals travel on and around it every day. But this has not always been as convenient as it is today. Even in the late 1920s, it was a busy city, and ferries like these kept both sides of the harbour connected before the Sydney Harbour Bridge was completed in 1932. The first train to cross the new bridge. The first of many that these days carry thousands of passengers a day. This is Sydney's premier railway station, Central. Yes, I've made it. Central Station. Most capital cities have a grand station like this. Built in 1906, 25 platforms. This grand concourse says it all. I'm off to platform one and a date with the Indian Pacific. There's always a sense of adventure in the air as the Indian Pacific prepares to leave Sydney. We've got passengers from all walks of life. People going back to Perth, tourists, backpackers, and people like me, just going along for the ride. There we go, that's the one. Yeah. Cross you up here. On yeah. time today? We sure are. Very good. That's true. Yeah. Here we go. All right, dear. He said compartment four and three. Ah, home away from home. Look at this. This is a classic twinette compartment. The bunks will come down for nighttime use, set up for daytime at the moment. Got my own little hanging cupboard here. Little card table here. Everything's organised. Lights are on. <coughs> Put the ticket there. In here, shower and toilet. Look at this cute little room. So we have our basin here, hot and cold. We have toilet. Oh, yes. Fantastic little unit. I love railway carriages. They're so compact and practical. This is one of the longest train journeys in the world. 2,720 miles. Or three days and three nights on the train to Perth. First, though, we head out through Sydney's suburbs and back up to the Blue Mountains. so long ago, you'd be quite right in calling it stodgy. But not anymore. Nowadays, the menu is a gourmet treat. Some competition from other forms of transport has lifted the standard dramatically. Even the wine list not to be scoffed at. Ha! While I've been dining, the conductor's been busy. Good night, then. See you in the morning. Good morning. Oh, Annie. Hey, cup of tea. Let's see. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Hey, Annie, where are we? Just before Melindy. Excellent. Look at this. How civilised. I'm in the first sitting for breakfast. Didn't have a bad night's sleep either. So I better get up and at it. These are the Menindee Lakes, part of the Great Darling River system. 
bit of a shock to see so much water out here in the desert, but there it is. Good fishing, I'm told, too. The route of the Indian Pacific crosses the border from New South Wales to South Australia. Our first stop is Peterborough. Now, as you probably know by now, I'm a bit of a history buff. And there's something up here at the old roundhouse that I really want to see. And no, it's not a train. It's what they run on, the tracks. And I've got to say that back in the early days, when our rail network was being built, the coordination between the states concerning the tracks was appalling. For example, when it came time to decide the width of the track the train should run on, this is the gauge I'm talking about. Everybody virtually went their own way and built what they liked. They even wrote a report about it in 1856, and I quote, I am desirous of alluding to the fact that there is a diversity of gauges that exist between this and the other colonies of Australia. The magnitude of the evils that must ultimately arise at no distant period and be entailed upon the future inhabitants of the colonies from this circumstance can hardly be overrated. And I would therefore submit that it is a question deserving the attentions of the various governments. Gotha K. Mann, Railway Commissioner, New South Wales Railways, 1856. It wasn't until 1970 that the line from Sydney to Perth was finally standardised. That's the line we're running along now. It was a mess all round. It certainly hindered our economic development. This is one of the famous South Australian triple gauge yards, where goods came in on one gauge and had to be transferred over onto another. In Peterborough, there are no less than three gauges. On this turntable, there's broad, standard and narrow gauge. It made carting goods by rail very inefficient. And you can see how road transport soon came to dominate the freight industry. The author of that report had the right idea, but nobody in power listened to him. And, a century and a half later, we're still paying for it. The Indian Pacific train has brought us to the outskirts of Adelaide, South Australia's capital. We'll pull in at Keswick Terminal. As you can see, it's pretty new. Adelaide's original central station sits in the middle of the city, and sadly, the large interstate trains don't pull in there anymore. But we'll have a look at that in a moment. New railway stations leave me a bit cold. I don't know, it's like they don't evoke the spirit of train travel or something. Adelaide's a little different to some of the other Australian cities. For a start, 95% of South Australia's total population live here, which either says a great deal about Adelaide, or that there aren't many other places to live in South Australia. Adelaide is the youngest of the large coastal cities. It has a provincial nature, a calmer pace, and a society which revels in fine food and wine, and a much gentler way of life. Now this is what I call a railway station. It's classic American style. Looks like it was inspired by Grand Central itself. This grand edifice was built by American railwayman, Commissioner William Alfred Webb in the 1920s. He was brought in to rejuvenate a declining and worn out railway system. Bill did a good job. He had some big ideas though, and this was one of them. He built it and nearly sent the state broke in the process. That's because the size and the facilities of this place were more suited to a large city like Philadelphia than a small state capital like Adelaide. Never mind. It's here now. Except for the small local domestic train service, Adelaide Railway Station isn't used much these days. However, one very interesting train does still leave from Adelaide Railway Station. These are the Bluebird rail cars. My carriage is called the Plumber. Now, why didn't somebody think of this a long time ago? A train trip to the Barossa Valley, the South Australian homeland of fine wine and good living. 
The Bluebird fleet was once the mainstay of the state's country passenger services. Withdrawn from service in 1991, these cars lay idle until somebody had the brilliant idea to use them as a day tripper service up to the Barossa Valley. The Barossa is world famous for the quality wines produced here. The area was originally founded by German Lutheran immigrants who bought the vines and the expertise to the area well over a hundred years ago. Obviously, the best part about a visit here by train is that you don't have to draw straws to see who's going to drive the car home. I'm back at Keswick Terminal, the departure point for the GAN to Alice Springs. This would have to be one of the world's great trains, with a wealth of history attached to it. I can hardly wait to get on board. Very well, thanks. Good, we're travelling in C1 and 2, it's the first cabin on the right. The Udna Data car, no less. Data car. Excellent. There we go. Looks Just good. Say thank you, sir. The journey from Adelaide to Alice Springs takes 20 hours. It's 972 miles through some of the world's most beautiful, but sometimes inhospitable country. Maybe that's why they all live in Adelaide. Sometimes it's fun to look backwards, particularly when you're leaving a city. Bye, Adelaide. This particular service is so filler that Great Southern Railways have decided to double the length of the train. It's 30 carriages all up, two club cars, two restaurant cars. It's 1,500 tonnes, 350 people on the train. It's a popular train. Long distance trains are a bit like hotels on rails. Once the excitement of leaving the station is over, it's a short stroll from your sleeper to the club car to sit and chat or contemplate the passing scenery. And as you can see, there's no shortage of that on this journey. And on through the night we go. The next morning, the GAN is hurtling across the wide expanse of the outback. I've got to tell you, this is not the original GAN line. The old line's a fair bit to the east. This is relatively new. It was constructed in 1980. The original line followed the inland trail of the explorer John McDowell Stewart and the old Afghan camel trains that followed him. It runs along the base of the Flinders Ranges and south of Lake Eyre. But it had to be shifted because it was prone to track flooding in the wet. The train takes its name, of course, from the Afghan Cameleers, who did so much to open up this country. Long before the railway came along, camel teams supplied the telegraph and the pastoral stations, no matter how isolated or far away they were. But that's another story. They moved the line for good reason, but it's on the old line where the good stories lie, and that's what I plan to do when I get to Alice. Let's trace the old line all the way back down to Port Augusta. Alice Springs is the unofficial capital of the Red Centre. It's a small town, only about 20,000 people, but with a lot of character. Originally established as a relay station for the Overland Telegraph, it was named Alice after the wife of the Postmaster General of South Australia, Sir Charles Todd. Unlike the railway, the Overland Telegraph, of course, was the one transcontinental venture that actually did make it all the way from the southern coast at Adelaide to the northern coast at Darwin. In 1929, the line finally reached Alice Springs, but there it stopped. There have been plenty of plans to extend it, but it hasn't happened yet. Time to head south 
on our mammoth trip down the old route. This is the Old Gan Preservation Society, just outside Alice Springs. They've got about 15 miles of the original Old Gan track that runs down to a place called Ueninga Siding. Other than this and a few remnants, there's not much left of the old line until you get to Quorn, roughly 750 miles away in the lower Flinders Ranges. It's an irony that such a desolate area can be so flood prone, but it's a fact. Track washouts were common. A two-day journey could turn into two weeks quite easily. Drivers had to carry guns to shoot wild goats so that they could feed the passengers if they became stranded for too long. There are stories of people hopping down from the train while it slowly crept along over the damaged track to pick wildflowers which sprang up everywhere after a good soak. In the end, the line virtually destroyed itself because it was just too costly to keep open. When they closed the line, they pulled up most of the track which under normal circumstances would cause me a few problems. But I've decided to draw on experiences of the past for this one. <laughs> I love this. Look, my very own camel train, complete with provisions and swag to take me down the line. <laughs> this is Daisy, and this is Saeed. Two healthy-looking camels. They should get me down to Port Augusta, no problem. The route of the old line I'm following passes through some legendary towns of the Australian outback. Some of these places are just ruins now, abandoned long ago. Others, like Udnadatta, are still viable townships, but nothing like the hives of activity they were when the railway came through. The railway finally reached Udnadatta in 1891. Considering construction started in Port Augusta 13 years earlier, it took a fair while to get there. Up until 1929, the only way to get up to Alice Springs from here was by a six-day camel ride. When the railway arrived, and for the next 40 years, the town was a hive of activity, the railhead for all points north. I can see why the old cameleers chose to walk a lot. Oh, bit hard on the old backside. You know. Even though the line has gone, there's plenty of evidence to show where it went. 24 miles south of Udnadatta, this is the Algy Buckner Bridge. It's 1,873 feet long, and it was fabricated in England. The interesting thing about this bridge is that it was never meant to be here in the first place. The intention was to ship it out to Australia and use it to span the River Murray. But when it arrived, they found it was too short. So, it ended up here at Algy Buckner. Now the only thing missing is the old GAN itself. one of the most famous watering holes in the country. Where else can you park your plane in the main street and stroll into the pub for a cool drink? Recently, the William Creek Hotel was deemed so important to our outback history that it was placed on the National Heritage List. 
The place is decorated with the mementos of the many visitors who've quenched their thirst here. Publican Malcolm Anderson is proud of the hotel's history. Been hanging up there for quite some years now, yeah. probably 30, 40, maybe even 50 along the years. But, now, uh, talking of history, yeah. what's the story behind the pub? Uh, the pub was built in 1887 to service the, the Garn Railway Line. Mm -hmm. What you see now is what it was in 1887. It's definitely unique. It's in the middle of nowhere, or you could put it another way, it's in the middle of everywhere because it's pretty central. So when the temperature's 50 degrees outside, how do we keep the beer cold? Are we going all right? It's difficult, but it can be done. In outback terms, William Creek is right next door to one of Australia's true natural wonders, Lake Eyre. And the best way to take a look at it is from the air. My pilot, Jerry Waddington. Oh, well, yeah, we'll head directly out to London. It's, um, it's a little bit of a run out, but uh, not too far. I suppose you've seen Lake Eyre in all sorts of conditions. And yeah, just about every condition. It's dry at the moment. There's a little bit of water in the south end of the North Lake. But last year, February last year, we had uh, we had about six inches of rain in a matter of two weeks, yeah. and uh, that filled the lake. See, that'd be fairly impressive up there with one of the biggest lakes in the world, isn't it? It is, yes, it is, and uh, it's also the lowest point in Australia, which is 15 metres below sea level. Right, yeah. Can we land on it? Uh, no, I wouldn't like to put this on it, no. <laughs> right. Not suitable for landing, maybe, but we're flying over the dry, salt-encrusted surface of the lake, where, in 1964, Sir Donald Campbell set his world land speed record in his jet-powered car, Bluebird. The lake was discovered in 1840 by the explorer Edward Charles Eyre, after whom it's named, and it's now part of a three million acre national park. It seems Jerry has only just turned the plane back towards William Creek, when there below is the line of the old GAN. It's time to come back down to earth, swap engines for camel power, and rejoin Daisy for the next leg of my journey. This is Farina, another former railhead. 300 people called Farina home once. The original plan when it was settled in 1878 was to grow wheat here, but the harsh climate soon put pay to that. When I come to a place like this, I can't help thinking about the people who once lived here, why they came here, what their aspirations were. Bits and pieces of their lives are strewn all over the place. An old car body over there. A bed head. The old bakery oven's still here. Even the glass heap tells a story. Every one of these bottles is a French champagne bottle. <laughs> Look at this. You'd think they were living in the lap of luxury. But actually, there's another story to it. Apparently, they used to have these bottles set up from Adelaide and put other less expensive liquids in them. Still, somebody in Adelaide was having a pretty good time. <coughs> anyway, I've got to keep my train onto its timetable. I've got an appointment to keep. An appointment that will see me part cup with my animal friends and get back on board a train. Coming up to Corn, near the end of the line now. Give it up. Gorn is a quiet little country town nestling in the lower Flinders Ranges of South Australia's mid-north. A pretty place. And it has a great railway station, by the way. But I'm excited about this place for another reason. I couldn't ask for a more fitting end to my journey down the old GAN line than a trip on the Pitchy Ritchie Railway. Besides the track at Alice Springs, where I began my journey south, the Pitchy Ritchie Railway is the only other part of the old GAN line left with a train still running on it. It runs from Quorn down to Woolshed Flat through the Pitchy Ritchie Pass, a distance of about 50 miles. The folks at Pitchy Ritchie are a dedicated bunch of volunteers 
who in addition to providing a great train ride, work really hard to preserve the history and culture of the old GAN. did it. The old GAN line complete. All I have to do now is wait for the Indian Pacific that'll take me on to Western Australia. I've rejoined this great transcontinental railway that runs all the way from the east coast to the west coast. This is the line that's going to take me to Perth. This is also the line that can boast the longest straight stretch of track anywhere in the world, from Uldir to just past Lungana. 303 miles without the hint of a curve. The Nullarbor Plain, vast, flat, lonely. A place rarely disturbed by anything except for legends and myths, and this extraordinary railway line. The guidebook on the train tells me that the Nullarbor is twice the size of New York, or roughly the size of Colorado. Whatever, it's big and as flat as a pool table. What you've got to appreciate is how much of it looks like this. It's one of the few places where you can stand in one spot and see the curvature of the earth. It stands to reason that any kind of human habitation out here is a welcome sight. We're pulling into Cook, one of the most remote towns on the planet. Cook's sole reason for existence is to service the railway. Normally, passengers on the Indian Pacific would only get a fleeting visit to Cook when the train stops here for water. But I love railway towns and I can't resist the urge to jump train for a couple of days and have a sniff around. Oh, Hi. Kelly. Hope you had a good trip. Oh, it was excellent. Thanks for everything. Not Thanks for looking after me. I particularly enjoyed breakfast over the desert this morning. That was great. That's good. I heard that the place was in the process of being closed down as a town. So, I was curious to see just what was left. Once Cook boasted a population of 90 people, now the permanent population is down to three. Bruce, his wife Michelle, and their baby. <laughs> what do you mean? This is it. This is it, mate. The table inhabitants. Plus 11 very energetic guard dogs who like to run around a lot. And a bemused kangaroo who, generally speaking, prefers to remain above all the noise and excitement. So you work for the railways? Uh, we do, mate. Yeah, we're the caretakers yeah. of Cook. Yeah. The caretakers of Cook? Yeah. Gee, it's like meeting the mayor and mayor is <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> so when the train pulls in, how many people get off? Well, you get, you know, about 400, up, up to 400. That's when the, when the wild players are on. It's an extra long train then. So they've got a couple of hours and then they're all back on the train again. Yeah, and you're back to your peace and quiet? Yeah, back to, until uh, the next Indian Pacific. Cook was built in a time when trains depended on it for fuel, water and food. Now, with the many advances in railway technology, places like Cook are no longer required. The school, the hospital, the nurse's residence, all due for demolition. Recently, the track workers were moved out. But changeover drivers still rest here at the railway barracks. In fact, although practically a ghost town now, as far as the line's concerned, Cook is still busy. Up to 53 trains a week pass through here.
So there's still quite a few people coming oh, and going from the place. Wednesday and Saturday night, and it's full on. So there's what do we do for fun here? What do we get up to? Oh, there's golf. Golf! <laughs> well, I think he's got me in now. <laughs> now, don't get too excited. This course is not quite Augusta. Bruce has rounded up a couple of other players. A train driver and a shunter. That's your ball anyway, I think. No. I don't think so. This is my ball. Oh! oh. Oh, a gruelling six holes is this. <clears throat> sure, it's pretty flat, and the water traps don't often come into play, but the sand is unforgiving. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Ooh, break that. As the game drew to a close, a I couldn't help wondering if Bruce's caretaking responsibilities also included the maintenance of the golf course. <laughs> so are you the greenkeeper? Uh, well... Not lately. <laughs> Not lately. Uh, what's green keeping consist of here on this course? Uh, you wait until summer and all the grass falls out and it's, there's no green to keep. <laughs> right. Cook's the sort of place you'd probably only visit once in a lifetime. And I've certainly made the most of my overnight stay. The Indian Pacific will continue to stop here. But as a town, it's a fast fading place of wonderful railway memories. Here we go. Car see, this is me. Yeah, right. Good night. Good thanks. My name's Neil. Oh, right, I had a great time, met some wonderful people, and satisfied my long-standing fascination for railway towns. They're strange places at times, but that's what I love about them. Western Australians have always been an independent bunch. Even at the Federation of Australia back in 1901, they were less than enthusiastic about joining up with the other states. But the promise of this railway line went a long way to convincing them that it was a good idea. At the time, there was a rail network of sorts around the country, even though it was a hopeless tangle of different sized tracks. But the one daunting gap between Port Augusta and Kalgoorlie was yet to be conquered. Work began in 1912 when two crews set out, one from Kalgoorlie in the west and the other from Port Augusta in the east. Over 3,000 workers battled incredibly harsh conditions, laying an estimated 90,000 sleepers as they pushed the line forward. On October the 17th, 1917, in a remarkable feat of surveying and engineering, the two construction teams met at Uldir, 683 miles east of Kalgoorlie. At last, the line across the Nullarbor and the Transcontinental Rail Link was built. Next stop on the line, Kalgoorlie, Australia's El Dorado. Kalgoorlie as a gold mining town was once more important to Western Australia's economy than Perth. It looks pretty civilised now, but once the city was about as close as you could get to a wild west town. Gold was found here in 1892. By the late 1890s, Upwards of 1,400 miners were arriving here every week. The rush was on. One such budding millionaire was Herbert Hoover. In 1929, he became the 31st President of the United States. Before that, though, he was a mine manager here in Kalgoorlie. He made quite a name for himself while he was here, not only as a mine manager, but also as a gentleman with a keen eye for the ladies. He was a familiar face at one of the local watering holes, where there's an interesting testament to his patronage. This magnificent mirror was a gift from Herbert Hoover to the Palace Hotel. He had it shipped out from America. It was in appreciation for a friendship he had here with a barmaid. <laughs> Mighty fine friendship, I'd say. Perhaps by making this gift, Herbert was ensuring that tales of his fun and games down under didn't come back to haunt him while he was in the White House. Once gold was discovered in Kalgoorlie, two things were essential for its survival. Fuel, water. The whole area around Cal used to be forested. 
But as the mines grew, so did the demand for timber. The whole place was cleared, most of it ending up in the steam engines that ran the place. The timber companies found themselves going further and further out for the wood. The quickest way to do it was by train. So they built a network of railway tracks that spread out like a giant cobweb, up to 80 miles out from Kalgoorlie. The old dirt ballast that the tracks used to lay on are still here. It's fascinating to walk along them and imagine the old steam trains, their trucks loaded to the top, heading back to town. Up to two and a half thousand tonnes of wood could be delivered back to Kalgoorlie daily on these little trains. Hundreds of thousands of tonnes altogether. It wasn't long before the wood ran out and the trains disappeared completely. There's a bit of Kalgoorlie's rail history that's still running, though. And if you think they run on a loose bush timetable, you're wrong. Quick! Oh, well, you know, you never know. We're travelling on what's left of the old Kalgoorlie boulder line. In the old days, there were 1,200 mining companies working the Golden Mile. This was the way everyone got around. The train was the major urban link between Kalgoorlie, Boulder and the mines. Sadly, today, the never-ending quest to find more gold has relegated the line to being the train to nowhere. End of the line, full stop. Why? Because the massive super pit, which has replaced the 1,200 original mines on the Golden Mile, has swallowed up almost everything. There's no alternative but to turn around and head straight back home again. Kalgoorlie to Perth. 370 miles until the end of the transcontinental line and my journey across the nation. This was the scene on February the 23rd, 1970, when the first train to travel all the way on the same size track pulled in from Sydney. It was only 53 years after the line was first connected in 1917. Not bad as far as building the national rail network went. Perth and its surroundings have changed a bit since then. A friend once described Perth to me as a place where you go window shopping for minerals. It's a mining town without the mines. Perth sits alongside the Swan River, with the port of Fremantle a further 15 miles to the west on the coast. Fremantle hosted the America's Cup yacht race in 1987. Suddenly, all eyes were on one of the most isolated cities in the world, as it transformed from a sleepy coastal port into a cosmopolitan hub. Just off the coast here is Rottnest Island. It's a picturesque and popular tourist resort. Rottnest is famous as the home of some endearing rat-like marsupials called quokkas. And the island even has a little train ride. But we need to go back on the mainland and head further south. That's where we'll find some far more impressive engines. To get down there, we're using the Australin. She's taking us about 55 miles south of Perth to a place called Pinjarra, the home of the Hotham Valley Tourist Railway. It's an excellent setup with some of Australia's great steam locos. Hotham Valley is an interesting outfit. They've been going for about 23 years and they operate trains all over the West Rail system. Funny thing though, when I rang to let them know I was coming, I got the strangest reply. Great, they said. You'll come in handy. Sounds like they're going to put me to work. Oh, well, I don't mind helping out a bit here and there. Whoa, I might have spoken too soon. I'm going to be busy. Next assignment, clean out the firebox on the Marinup. 
He just dropped the fire here, do you, mate? Yeah, we cleaned the fire out here, Scott, yeah. Right, eh? Oh, yeah, this'll be fun. It's steam, after all. Yeah, that'll do you. It's loosening up a bit, yeah. Oh, yes, that's very good. This is Clary, by the way, one of Hotham's dedicated volunteer drivers. Just pull that lever up, Scott. Pull the lever, yeah. Pull the lever right, right up and the ash will fall out. Egg. I think we've emptied it, Clary. That's very good. Nothing ever seems to worry old steam train drivers, does it? Next job, prepare the Marin up for the 1015 to dwelling up. Excellent. to dwelling up. Open up that regulator, Clary, and let her rip. The line to dwelling up and beyond was opened in 1910 to service the little timber towns of the Darling Range. We're talking about Carry and Jowra country here. Dwelling Up is just under nine miles away from Pinjarra, up Western Australia's steepest and most spectacular section of railway. It's a stiff one in 30 grade up the escarpment. That's quite a climb. So two locos hooked together are needed for the job. You can hear them working now, but they're not the only ones. These are W-class mountain-type locomotives. They're perfect for this type of work because they're relatively light and they can handle the tight curves on a line like this. Beautiful, aren't they? Now you can see why I was so keen to make this trip. Dwelling Up was once a busy centre for the thriving timber industry. Nowadays, instead of being a mill town, it's the setting out point for showing off the magnificent forests. The work here at Hotham Valley probably gives you some insight into how much effort goes into running a viable tourist railway. It's not easy, but it's also a lot of fun. I'm having the time of my life doing this. And how many people ever get this opportunity? Heading out by myself on this little quad, into the fresh air and the forest for an honest day's work on the line. I can't believe they're ever really short of volunteers in a place like this. As I mentioned earlier, this is Cowrie and Jarrah country, timber that's known the world over for its toughness and beauty. This is Les, one of Hotham's permanent employees. What a job, eh? Hey, Les. How are you, How are you Scott? Oh, that's a top run through the bush. Oh, yeah, it is. Imagine. It's really good. Yeah, hey. yeah. So, what's happening? i uh, just got to change a couple of sleepers here. Yeah. Um, right, what do you want me to do? What I'd like you to do is go up and get a sleeper for me. Right, where do I go? Uh, about three k's up that way. Yeah. Uh, just go up the track on your right-hand side and go up and see Peter up there. Right, Peter, what's he doing up there? He's a sleeper cutter. Once the timber from this country was used mostly for railway sleepers. Not only here in Australia, but in India, Pakistan and America. Not now, though. It's far too precious. In the old days, of course, the sleepers were hewn by hand. I imagine nowadays that that art is long gone. It'll all be chainsaws and the like now. Well, how wrong can a bloke be? That wasn't a track I just walked up, but a time warp. At the end of it, was this huge mountain of a man cutting sleepers by hand. You, Peter? Yes? I'm supposed to pick up some sleepers, is this oh, right? Yeah. Yep. I'll get some for you in about half an hour. Like just about everyone else around here, Peter Rado is a man of few words. He's the gentle giant of the Hotham Valley. And it's his job to supply all the new sleepers for the line, in the old-fashioned way.
Peter took over the job from his father, a Yugoslav migrant who came to Australia in 1920. This was his dad's only job for the entire 70 years of his working life. How long have you been doing this, Peter? Oh, about... <laughs> you're the max for about 45, 46 years now. So how long does it take you to knock out a sleeper? Oh, I should do one in an hour. That yeah, Russian. Okay, Scott. This is where good old steak and eggs comes into it. Put it over there with that one. That's it. Yeah, right. Up you go first. Oh. Okay? Yeah, got it. Wow. So I know. in there. Hey. Goodness me. See, I reckon this is going to stay under the rails for a few years. Now, look, uh, I'll take this one down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right, there, Scott. And I'll see you in about half an hour. I'll come back in a moment for the other one. Now, all I've got to do is get this sleeper down to Les. These trikes literally turn around on a dime. Watch, I'll show you. <laughs> you think they've thought of reverse? the sun sets in the west. The fastest way back across the two and a half thousand miles to the southeastern states is by plane. The southern state of Victoria is our next stop. A state with a regal history and a very different feel to the west. Now if we're talking rail history and rail heritage, then there's no better place to start our Victorian journey than in Seymour, right in the middle of the state. This fascinating place is the holding yard for some of Victoria's historic carriages. Established in 1983, the Seymour Railway Heritage Centre cares for, renovates and maintains a vast array of rolling stock for V-Line, the Victorian Government Railway. There's a steam locomotive here and a couple of diesel locomotives, but it's this carriage that really turns me on. This is the Yarra Parlour Car, and it's the personification of opulence for the Victorian era rail passenger. It was built in 1906 of Cedar and Blackwood. You had to pay a premium to travel on this carriage, and it's not hard to see why. This is one of the finest restorations I've ever seen. I can really handle a journey in a car like this. However, the transport for our next destination is a little more humble but a wonderful bit of Victorian railway history just the same. I feel like a kid who's got Dad's car for the weekend. What a little beauty this is. It's a rare diesel electric rail motor. It was built in 1932 at Victorian Railway's Newport workshops. They reckon it's the last one of its kind still running on the main line. Her official title is RM58, but she's better known to those who look after her as Daisy. For 60 years, Daisy faithfully served the community, carrying first and second class passengers, plus two or three freight wagons hitched on the back. Next stop, Pachuca and the mighty Murray River. past hangs over this place like a cloud of steam. Pachuca was once the biggest inland port in Australia. This used to be the busiest railhead in the country at one point. The locals call this the meeting of the whistles because it was here that the trains and the river boats would meet. The wool would be loaded off the boats onto the trains for shipment out to Melbourne. 
the riverboat era brings to mind all kinds of evocative images. Men and women working their way up and down the river, navigating the ever-changing and sometimes dangerous waterways to compete for cargoes in faraway places. Today, the love for the river life lives on through young people who've taken up the trade and the skills of the old rivermen. The paddle steamer Adelaide was built in 1866 and is the oldest wooden hulled paddle steamer still operating in the world. Her magnificent old steam engines are a living, breathing testament to the wonders of steam technology. Back to our diesel electric though, as Daisy takes us on the next part of our journey. The flagman up ahead, put the yellow flag. Better slow down, there's going to be a couple of detonators in a moment. As the rail motor runs over them, the detonators explode. Oh. This is the way track gangs warn train drivers that there's someone on the line. I've got the track gang just up here. Got to slow down the five feet. Keep up the good work, fellas. <laughs> Bendigo was the centre of one of the biggest gold fields in Victoria. Thousands of people flocked here from all over the world for their share of the gold. In the 1850s, tens of thousands of Chinese fortune seekers from the Pearl River Delta, west of Hong Kong, fled poverty, land feuds and devastation brought on by the opium trade. They boarded ships for what they called Dai Gum San, or the Big Gold Mountain better known to most people as Bendigo. Russell Jack, a leader of the community in Bendigo, describes how the Chinese played a huge, but not always happy part in the history of the gold fields. understand firstly that most of them were indentured. Ah. And they had to try and find enough gold to send back to China to pay their landlords, because they had paid for the uh, fee for them to come out here. Formidable obstacles were put in the immigrants' way by the European colonists. Well, because they spoke a different language, they ate different food, and they worked very long hours, they treated dreadful. A lot of them died very young age because of loneliness and sicknesses that they never encountered back in China. So they wouldn't lose their heritage, the Chinese community in 1882 raised 750 pounds amongst themselves. With this money, they imported more than a hundred crates of processional regalia. The Bendigo collection is now one of the finest collections of Chinese ceremonial artifacts surviving anywhere in the world today. Bendigo has always had ceremonial dragons. The current incumbent is a fellow called Sung Lung. Magic. And he's a beauty. So this is Sung Lung? Yeah, real dragon. Isn't he big? At 110 yards, Sun Lung is the world's longest imperial dragon. Made of silk and embroidered with over 90,000 mirrors. Everything on the dragon is symbolic of something. It's a rain dragon. See the blue mountains? Yeah. Snow on top of the mountains. The snow melting coming down the rivers and the oceans. Just what you need, a rain yeah. dragon for a drought-ridden yeah. continent, yeah. don't you? Yeah. And then the mirrors, huh. they reflect all the evil spirits, yeah. frighten them all away. I <laughs> see. How many blokes did it take to carry it? 54, the one time? Really? Yeah. Hmm. You see, it's Easter time, and each year at this time, he rises from his den in order to take part in the Easter Monday parade. I've heard that they sometimes need extra volunteers to carry him. How many have you got today? Oh, just a little bit short. Want a job? Yeah, well, I'm here for the day. Okay, we'll put you on the tail. On the tail? Yeah. Yes, this is what Russell has suggested for me, the Sun Lung section. First time I've been a Sun Lung. <laughs> Once we've been checked into our groups, we can line up for our complimentary meat pie and sauce. It's very Chinese, isn't it? Pie the pasty. Hang well here. This is to give us the strength we'll need to keep us going on the march. Okay. I feel like I'm in this gang. Pale gang. <laughs> this is like organising extras for a film shoot. Yeah. Oh, I think this one's better organised than some. You want the guy to... Yeah, beauty. 
and the gaiters and the sash. In a relatively short space of time, everyone is organised, fed, given their costume, and then shown how to dress. Put your pants on with the tie to the rear and bring it round to the front of your waist and tie it up. Do they symbolise different things, right? Uh, uh, symbolise uh, colour uh, and movement, I'd yeah. say. <laughs> You'll see a bit of movement in that. <laughs> Those who are putting their gaiters on, the narrow part of the gaiter, start at the ankle and work your way up the leg. Yeah. I'm just doing some limbering up exercises too. <laughs> the dragon tail <laughs> The Easter Carnival dates back to 1869 and is said to be one of Australia's oldest surviving carnivals. Dragons have been parading in the carnival since 1892. In fact, Bendigo has long been known as the number one dragon city outside China. It's time for Sun Lung to wake up and move. But getting him up and unwinding his long body from around the perimeter of the museum and out the front door is an exercise that must be carried out with military precision. And we're off. No rips, no tears, everybody travelling in the same direction. So far, so good. Here we go. Sun Lung always brings up the rear of the parade, which has actually been in progress for some time already. Nick and his mates have been carrying the tail for 20 years. So it's quite an honour to get a look in at all. All the prayer can see you, but I can't see the stomach. Oh, right. And they're out in the open. Right. So they can see what's going on, they can see the changeovers. Oh, because the tail's up high, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 Nick will yell out to you and say, hey, Scott, come here, change. And you so I get underneath. And, you, and he helps you put it in your little pouch. Yeah. And we've got to keep it active all the time, looking good. But the problem is you can't see where you go. You just accentuate whatever the person in front of you do. Accentuate. So if you're running, I'm galloping. That's right. <laughs> That's a real high. The Chinese community in Bendigo is very much part of the scenery here. They're proud of their heritage and the part they played in the history of the goldfields. It's hard to imagine this parade, or in fact, the goldfield story itself, without them. To the clamour of drums and cymbals, and the ear-shattering explosions of the firecrackers, Sun Lung goes home to his lair, to sleep for another year. I can only use Daisy for part of the next leg of our journey, but I promise you the diversion will be worth it. There are some places you just have to visit, even if the train doesn't take you there. This is the old branch line to Mansfield, the line up to the high country. Foggy, isn't it? The first train rolled along this line in 1891. The last train ran in May 1977. Not a bad run, I suppose. Now the line's being transformed into a bushwalking and horse riding trail. Great new use for the old permanent way. You know how I feel, though? Still like to see an iron horse riding on it. beneath the trees and flash by gullies deep. 
and hear the echo when she's gone rush back again to sleep. Through Kerrisdale and Homewood, the green light lured her on. Click clack o'er points and crossings, the Mansfield train was gone. When the line was opened up here to the high country, it completely transformed the sleepy town of Mansfield. The line was kept busy hauling timber and cattle off to market in Melbourne. Being such a pretty little place with good clean mountain air, holiday makers and honeymooners became a regular sight on the station platform. time you turned up. Hey <laughs> Scott, how are you mate? Pity about the trains eh Bruce? <laughs> how long you been here? Bruce McCormack and his brother Paul are the genuine article. High country horsemen. Their family has run cattle in the mountains for generations. This is the real reason I've come up to the high country. Hey. I hadn't been up this way for a long time, so it was high time to catch up. Here we go. Cue the classic theme music. This is magic stuff. High country, here we come. Cattle down the valley there. Eh? Plenty around, plenty around. Yeah. How many head you got? A couple hundred, I think. Yeah. We'll find out once, once you count them tomorrow. Once I count them tomorrow. Once you count. So we blame you if we, we don't get them all, you see. <laughs> right on. Cattle seem to know when mustering time has come, and they're not too fussed about being rounded up. Bruce tells me that some cattle will even turn up down at the homestead on the plain all by themselves. But that could be just Bruce's sense of humour. I fear that this is a way of life that will soon disappear from view altogether in modern Australia. Environmental pressures are slowly squeezing these tough horsemen and their cattle out of the mountains. I just hope, though, that in the years ahead there's something as colourful as this to come and wonder at in the magnificent Victorian high country. In Victoria, all lines lead to Melbourne. So, it's time we made our way there as our last stop in this state. Great way to enter the grand old city of Melbourne. You know, the thing I love about Melbourne is that amongst all the glitz and glamour, it still managed to maintain its original charm and character. Like the tramps, what a great way to see the city. <laughs> There's Liz. My old mate, she's going to show me around Melbourne in a tram. Hey, Liz. <laughs> great. Great to see you. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> oh, Liz. Excellent. Liz Campanaro has been conducting or driving trams for over 20 years. Hey, gee, I tell you, it's nice of them to give us this tram for the day. Yes, well, they told me it was for someone special, so they sent it just for you, so there oh. you go, yeah. But the coup was getting you to take us along. Yes, he was, yeah. Uh -huh. No one else was old enough, so they said, we'll send the old girl up. Oh. <laughs> Liz loves being a trammy because of the people she meets every day. But every day is different because you, you look at the expression on people's faces, some look upset, some look happy. And now I enjoy working for the public. Mm -hmm. Trams are the way to travel. 
Liz knows Melbourne like the back of her hand, and she's mapped out a route around the city centre today that'll carry me to some of the main attractions. First, I have to take you to the old Melbourne jail. Uh, old Melbourne jail? Yes. Do you mind if I, I just duck have... in and have a look? Because that's, you go, that's where Ned Kelly you. is, isn't it? Yes. Ned Kelly's legend looms large here at Old Melbourne Jail. He is, without a doubt, our most famous outlaw, an Australian Jesse James. He and his gang killed three policemen, robbed two banks, and held up a train. The end for the Kelly gang came when they had a shootout with police at the town of Glen Rowan. Even though he was wearing his famous armour, Ned was wounded and captured. When his armour was removed, 28 bullet wounds were found. But amazingly, Ned was still alive. He was taken by train to Melbourne and ended up here in a cold, dark cell. Ned was hanged on the 11th of November, 1880. Somehow, I always end up working for my keep. This time, it was changing the points. Liz didn't tell me about the water that collects way down deep inside them, though. Oh, I hate that! <laughs> Why'd you tell me? I believe... I was just going to say, be careful for the water, but you were too fast for me. We're coming towards the exhibition building. To a flourish of trumpets, cathedral bells and a salute of guns, it was here in Melbourne's exhibition building that Australia's Federation was born. I'm standing right about the spot where in 1901, the then Duke of Cornwall and York, later to be King George V, declared the first Parliament of Australia open. What a great place for the birth of a nation. Time to bid my very special Melbourne Goodwill Ambassador farewell. We'll have a safe journey now. Thank you, Liz. Take care. Look forward to the next Well, I came to Melbourne on a rail motor and I left on a tram. <laughs> yes. There's a certain symmetry about that that I like. To be perfectly accurate, I'm actually leaving Victoria on this ferry here, the spirit of Tasmania. And she's aptly named as she'll carry me across the water southwards to the island state of Tasmania. Welcome to Devonport, Tasmania. I've just crossed Bass Strait in this ferry here on the overnight journey from Melbourne. The sea was like glass. My cabin was comfy, which is just as well because I'm a bit of a landlubber. I'm keen to explore Tasmania, not just because I know it's a beautiful place, but because I'm doing it in a very special way, the way it should be done in my opinion, by train. This is the Don River Railway near Devonport. These people are some of the many keepers of Tasmania's remaining rail heritage, which is an important job because Tasmania is a bit different to the mainland states. I probably should tell you there's actually no passenger trains running in Tasmania anymore, which is a bit of a shame, really. But all is not lost. Steam buffs like the Don River people are still around to remind us of Tasmania's great rail past. As a matter of fact, through them, I'm getting a once-in-a-lifetime chance to see Tassie by rail. These locos are being prepared for a special mainline trip around the state, and I've been invited to join them. Before we set off, let's meet some of the Don River people and find out why they love this steam business so much. And 
in particular, Anne. Oh, because a woman up in the cab of a loco, it's a bit of a rare thing. Firing her up? Yes. I heard this one's been steamed today, so I thought I'd better have a look in. Good. Now, the obvious question has to be, is what it? is it about steam? The taste. The taste. The smell. Yeah, right. Inside. Yeah. And the sound, of course. And the sound, of course. Yeah. That just about sums it all up. The taste of steam. I couldn't have put it better myself. Old or young, male or female, something about steam just gets you in and holds you there. When you open your regulator, that's, that's the first position there, like that up there. Yep. And it will take off probably like a scalded cap with no, no load on it, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even blokes like Jeff, who drove on this line for 12 years, can't keep away from it, even in his retirement. Then you'd open it up and then pull it back to sneak away quietly. I reckon you could drive that. I'm a rusty old bloke and I can do it, so how about if you have a go at it? What's it? <laughs> right. Jeff is going to let me do something I love to do. Drive mainline steam locos. You don't have to open it right up to there to where I, I showed you. Right. Just do it by feel. She's off on her own. That's the roller bearing. Jeez, just moves off like a sewing machine. That's right. <laughs> Magic. So she really is a feel thing, isn't it? You've got to listen to the machine. Yep. You've got to ride them. You've got to be with them. Ride them. Yeah. No wonder they call them the iron horse. Right. You feel, you really feel like you're in the seat, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, time to hand the train driving back to the experts. And how's this for pure steam magic? Three locomotives, triple heading no less. They should get us down the line okay. Western Tasmania is a wild, remote place with dense forests and wilderness, unlike anything on the Australian mainland. Once minerals were discovered here in the middle of last century, the rush was on. Whole towns grew out of nowhere and just as quickly disappeared. Because the terrain was so tough, dozens of small gauge railways were built to service the towns and the mines. In fact, there were probably more small privately owned railways in this area once than anywhere else in Australia. It's no understatement to say that as you get closer to Queenstown, you notice a big change in the landscape. Rich green gives away to stark brown. Queenstown itself is quite a sight. These incredible hills give the place a kind of lonely frontier town feeling. Unfortunately, they're the result of some environmentally disastrous smelting practices in the past. Slowly the vegetation is growing back, though I don't think the hills will ever fully recover. Like so many railways in Tasmania, not much remains. But at the end of this little two foot gauge line, there's a real survivor. Meet the locomotive Wee Georgie Wood. Hey Bill. Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Tell me about the name, Wee Georgie Wood. Uh, it was uh, named after an English comedian in the 1920s. So it's like the Loco's a comic character, eh? Well, apparently he was a very small chap at the time, a <laughs> small comedian, and the, the Loco was named after him. By the people here? By the people here, yeah. <laughs> The small township of Tulla was established here in 1900. Wee Georgie came onto the scene in 1924 and was once the only link between Tulla and the rest of Tasmania. 
This little loco worked tirelessly, bringing people and goods in and taking ore out until 1964, when the highway opened and the railway became redundant. We Georgie was headed for the scrap heap, or to end up as a monument in a council park. But it was not to be. The thought of Tuller's little workhorse being laid to rest stirred the feelings of the local people, and the train was rescued and restored to its former glory. Perhaps the most amazing of all the little old private railway lines that once dominated the transport industry down here was the Apt. Now gone, it was built by the Mount Lyle Mining Company in 1894. Its purpose was to carry minerals from their mine in Queenstown and passengers to Strawn on the coast. The building of this railway is a wonderful story of courage and a struggle against impossible conditions. The train ran through some of the steepest rail inclines in the world, one in 16 grades, and needed a special third track. The system was invented by Dr. Roman Apt for similar steep situations in mountainous Europe. The middle rail had two rows of teeth that engaged with a gear on the locomotive to help pull the train up. On its journey, the train crossed many wild creeks and rivers including a wooden bridge a quarter of a mile long. Over a century after it was built, the route the line took can still be clearly made out. Local businessman and historian Viv Crocker has researched the story about the Apt. These people were basically finding a very large ore deposit by this time. People that had walked through this area from Straw and the prospectors, people forging north to look for riches, had uh, found a way through the bush and the, and the rivers, basically. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, the company decided, well, if I can get through this way, mm -hmm. we must be able to get through another way. For the surveyors to find a way through this bush, which has virtually remained unchanged to this day, was a feat in itself. It's pretty rough country, mate. It's rough. Uh, you can imagine we're walking along a civilised bit. Uh, when these old guys walked in in 100 years or so ago, they would have found the country like this all around them. They would have found uh, a jungle, virtually. Many people in 1894, including some of the surveyors working on the project, and many of Mount Lyle's shareholders, believed the railway was a waste of time and couldn't be built. But the engineering principles used by the builders were right on the mark. An example of the engineer's innovation and ideas is this bridge at Tipukana. It was shipped out from London in sections, assembled on pontoons and floated into place. The engineers then sank the pontoons with sandbags and secured the bridge in its position. The whole operation took three months. The small town of Tipukana flourished around this bridge. Today, there's nothing. But once, there was a wharf, a school, a police station, a hotel and about 40 homes. So, where are we now? Uh, we're at Rhino at the apex of the line. Uh, we've uh, got Strawn behind us. Mm -hmm. We've got Queenstown in front of us. And this, of course, was the 220 metre above sea level high point of the line. There were two lines here. Um, oh, double track here. Double track mm -hmm. here. Locos would water from the overhead gantry. Uh, they had water tanks built up into the, the bushes and up on the bank. this is what this is? This yeah, is the, the watering. Right. Two locos would frequently pull here and, and rewater. And they so had... there should be a major interchange with trains coming and going and watering. Yeah. And... There were a little small village along behind us. There were three little homes there. Where the, Nothing the left of that? Lived. Nothing left of it, oh. unfortunately. Uh, the families who lived here, of course, serviced the, the rack and serviced the app. This little train really was the lifeline of the district because at the time it was the only way in and out of the area. When the railway was finally closed in 1963 and the rails were removed, 
one of the most precious tourist assets that Tasmania possessed was lost. Nowhere else in Australia could such a trip be made, through dense, beautiful rainforests and mountainous country. But recently, government finance has been made available to restore the app to its former glory. And who knows, one day the little train of the mountains, with its shrill whistle and billowing clouds of steam, will run into Strawn Station once again. to our spectacular steam train ride for the next leg of our historic journey. Have you ever wondered what a guard does at the end of the train up here? Come and have a look. He cooks the bacon and eggs, of course. <laughs> Great job, Noel. Going well. Good on you. Yep, they're cooked. They're cooked. Smells great, mate. We're into it. We're heading towards Port Arthur and the site of the very first passenger railway in Australia. Port Arthur. This place would have to be the most recognised symbol of our convict past. When Governor George Arthur opened the penal settlement here in 1830, he decreed that prisoners should undertake the most unceasing labour with the most harassing vigilance. The place certainly lived up to those edicts in its time as a penal colony, right up until the last cell door was closed in 1877. Port Arthur has also served as a source of inspiration for many artists and writers over the years. For example, in 1927, Marcus Clarke's novel, For the Term of His Natural Life, became one of Australia's earliest feature films. But my real reason for coming to these parts is to search for a railway, or what's left of it. Built in 1836, it was a convict railway that ran from Norfolk Bay down to Port Arthur. Liz Patel, a guide from Port Arthur, has studied its history. It was used to carry coal equipment and people through to Port Arthur on the southern end of the peninsula. So it was like a convenient way to take the stuff across the land? It certainly was. It was a very short way. It only took about 30 to 45 minutes for convicts to push those wagons across the railway. It's a convict powered? It's a convict locomotion, we like to call it. <laughs> Good one. There's very little left to see of the old line, but this scene, taken from for the term of his natural life, gives you some idea what it looked like. The railway was just up on this mound up here. Oh, right. So it's, this is it? Yep. And this is roughly the width? Yes. Here we are. Yes. So the yes, convicts would have been up here like this, pushing the thing along? Yes, certainly. Or... Not, not what, one on each side, of course. One on, so yep. where you are yep. and yep. where I am here? Yep. And two oh, right. behind us again at the back of the wagon. Four convicts per wagon? Yes. yes. Pushing like with all their might? Yes. Yep. Convicts had to counterbalance as they went round the corners, leaning out, make sure that the uh, carriage didn't topple. Occasionally it did, and accidents did happen. <laughs> right. And of course it was the officials who got tipped. And then when the convicts came up to brush and pick them up and brush them right down nice and neat, they often picked their pockets. <laughs> Here at Long Bay lies the most visible remnant of the line, the remains of the old stone jetty. If you imagine the scene hard enough, you can just about see the whaleboats waiting here to take the freight and passengers down the coast to Port Arthur. What an intriguing chapter in our rail history. We're heading back to Don River now. Our special steam trip is just about over. And with it, we're close to the end of our nationwide journey too. Relaxing in this carriage, looking out at the passing countryside, conjures up some really evocative images for me. I can sense blokes going off to war, kids going off to boarding school for the first time. I can see a furtive glance across the carriage that ended in love. All this and more. What makes it so romantic for us?
I hope you've enjoyed coming with me to the places we've seen and meeting the characters we found at the end of the line. There's definitely an argument to be had for bringing passenger trains back, not just here in Tasmania, but all over Australia. And as you can see, it's happening. You know how I feel. There could be no better way to see this great country of ours than from the window of a train. See you next time soon. Another great late concert is coming up in a moment in the best of Hard Rock Live. Stay with us for music on KQED, on the web at kqed.org. program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.